everyone. I would like to uh, welcome you uh, to CC Talks. Uh, this is our professional forum uh, designed to explore emerging careers in innovative fields. I am uh, very uh, happy to bring the welcome of Cambridge College to all of you and the Office of President Jackson. Uh, these presentations are going to feature accomplished industry leaders, and I'm pleased this evening uh, to introduce to you Mr. Joe Roller, who is the former president and chief executive officer of Cambridge Bank Club here in Cambridge and the Cambridge Trust Company. Uh, Mr. Roller joined uh, the Cambridge Bank Corp as president and CEO in 2001. He was named CEO in 2003. Uh, under Mr. Roller's tenure, the company's assets uh, increased to $1.5 billion. Uh, since joining the company, uh, the Cambridge Bank Corp has consistently ranked in the top quartile of banks across the state. So this evening, we are pleased to bring to you one of Massachusetts' leading bank industry leaders, and I welcome Mr. Joe Roller and thank him for speaking to all of you this evening. Okay, so I have a choice. Let me just get an idea here. Does this look dignified? <laughs> I feel like I should be watching television. Um, what I'm going to do is, um, I'm going to start in this, but I feel like everyone is far away, a bit spread out. But um, I asked for some guidance from the school as to what to speak about. And it clearly part of it is banking. And I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit, uh, I'll talk about banking, but, but opportunities in banking, I'm going to save to the end because so much has changed. You know, you can tell by this gray hair that I've been around banking a long time and it's changed so much from when I started. But what I thought I'd do is tell you a little bit about how I got into banking, my career in banking, and then I've always found it helpful when I've heard people speaking to try to learn something from them so, um, about career. Uh, and this goes back over my 40 plus years in, in banking. So what I thought I'd do, if there is what I think a expression teachable moment but if there's an opportunity for me to share something from my perspective that may be helpful to you as your careers are starting or growing I'll do that you can file it away and say this was worthwhile or you can also put it in another file and say don't need that information so if that works for you at any time if I've said something that raises a question or you have a question please please tell me and I'll try to, I don't think they'll give me the hook, but I'll try to, to stay on target for, um, for my remarks. And then um, have questions from you, whether it's about something I've said, something about banking, um, I give personal advice, whatever you want, you know, or you have problems with dating or something, I can talk about that. <laughs> but um, let's get back to the business of tonight. Um, uh, Mark was generous with his introduction. I finished up my career as president of a wonderful community bank. And when I started out in banking in 1971, did I say to myself, I know what I want to be. I want to be a banker, and I want to be president of a bank. The answer to that question is no. As a matter of fact, when I graduated from college, I had no idea what I wanted to do, except for one thing. Uh, I'm so old, they used to have a lottery. And it was also a time of the Vietnam War, so they had a draft. They had a draft and they had a lottery. So I drew a very low number. I spent most of my second half of my senior year figuring out what am I going to do. I knew I was going to do some aspect of the military. So fast forward, I did that. And then I went back to my school and said I need a little help because while everybody in their, their semester was interviewing with companies, I was interviewing with the National Guard unit, with Air Force, you name it, I did it. Um, so I needed some help, and I got that help, and they sent me, uh, I grew up in New Jersey, so I went back, I figured I'd look for a job in uh, New Jersey. My parents were willing to take me back into the house, which was good, because I had no income. And I started to interview, and when I first started interviewing with banks, I figured, well, this will be a warm-up, because that's, banks aren't really companies. Um, 
I'll use them as a warm up and then I'll figure out what I want to do. But I like banking. I like what they, uh, so the first opportunity I had was a very small bank, very much like Cambridge Trust Company. And uh, it became very clear to me that uh, I was a sociology major. So unlike, I guess, most of you who are getting business degrees or getting business improvement, I had to get that after the fact once I started in the bank. So I started in a management training program, working in a branch, opening accounts, doing con consumer credit. But I went to school at night to get my accounting. And I can tell you probably the most valuable course I've had, and I think that will be mandatory even if you're going to a liberalized school, is accounting. And if you have management accounting, so much the better. But once I got into this position, it was clear to me that I wanted to be I need to get into the credit department where they do financial analysis on companies because I wanted to be a lender. So I worked towards that, that happened. And part of the messaging here is to be aware of opportunities. The bank I was working for wanted to set up an international department. And they picked from the trainee group, so I knew nothing about international, so I held my hand up and said, sounds good to me. I got involved in literally international banking and some of you may be familiar with it, but it's, I'm not gonna spend time talking about it, but that was the beginning of my career, which was, for the first half, was really all international banking. But it was about an opportunity that came up, and then I spent three or four years traveling to places. An overseas trip to me, when I grew up, was going from New Jersey across the Hudson River to New York, and now I'm traveling to places uh, in, in the Far East and in, in Australia. So that was an opportunity. And as my career moved along, still very young at that time, it was clear to me this bank was not gonna grow as fast internationally. So I took an opportunity in New York with a New York bank. And uh, there was a lesson here too, because it was a bit of a leap of faith that I have the skills that I could now go work in a much larger bank than I was working in. And I did that. It was worth the risk because I had much more exposure to international banking and corporate banking, much more substantial in the things that they were doing. But here again, a somewhat of a life lesson in career development. When I was in this group now of new colleagues, um, they all had MBAs. I didn't. I started to go to school at night. They had found what I call foundational training in operations. I didn't have that. I had a little of it. So the piece of advice, as much as we might like our careers to just go zooming like this, that can be good, but if you skip along the way, then you miss some of those valuable lessons. And I guess it would be similar, you know, if you had a really important class and the information was foundational to other material that was gonna be discussed in class, you missed it. I can tell you, I always felt a little bit uncomfortable. It took me a while to get up to speed. But then another opportunity came up, and it represented risk as well. And that was, I knew the guy who was the bank's representative in Australia uh, wanted to come home. So I put my hand up, and I said, and I was married, had, my wife was pregnant at the time, and uh, I put my hand up. Now, I was telling this, so I did go, to, we went to Australia, we lived in Melbourne for four years. It was a bit of a risk, but at the same time, a wonderful opportunity. Now, it was probably a bigger risk than I thought because I was telling this story you know, years after we were back. I was, my wife was sitting there, we're talking to another couple, and I said, well, I put my hand up and asked to go to Australia. And my wife looked at me and she said, you did what? <laughs> because she agreed to go, but she thought the bank had asked me to do that. <laughs> and so we went overseas with a four month old baby. So I started to, you know, I can still tell the story in her company, but I still get that look, you know, because just think about it, I don't know if anybody has kids here, but you, and if you do have kids, you know what it's like, all of a sudden, you've got the first grandchild, and then you're leaving and going 10,000 miles away. So we weren't popular with our parents, and when I got back, I wasn't popular with my wife. Um, so I want to move along and not take, too much time talking about this, but um, when I came back from Australia, I was with the same bank, working in New York, commuting an hour and a half from New Jersey to New York, uh, into the world, the then World Trade Center, and that was getting kind of old. And another opportunity came up, 
And that, actually, just let me go back to a second for uh, so-called putting my hand up uh, and make light of it. But it's really important when you're in any job, if you have an interest to, you, you see something in your organization um, and you think there's an opportunity, it's really important that you make someone aware of that. Don't assume that your supervisor, your manager, your boss, whatever it is, is gonna read your mind. Take the initiative, it's not being pushy, it's just sharing information. You know, I've been doing this job, I know there's an opening over here, I'd like to do that, I think I'm qualified to do it, so when you're considering someone, please consider me. And I think that's important, anything you do, no matter what the job, if there's some area that you wanna grow into, where you feel that it's, and I'll come back to this, it's part of building your own corporation, because each of you, in one way or another, is your own company. You're, you're, you're your own brand, you're selling yourself, you're earning a living, you're a microcosm, you're, you're a business, so let people know if, you, if there's something you're interested in. So I came back, we had a uneventful year being in the New Jersey community, an opportunity came up to join Baybanks. And Baybanks is no longer here, some of you may know of Baybanks. I knew nothing about it. But what Baybanks was doing was they were primarily a retail bank, but they were trying to grow their corporate business. So Bay Banks was going to do exactly what the bank that I started with in New Jersey, what they wanted to do was start an international department. So I, uh, and I can tell you, I wasn't their first choice. Um, they were, they had interviewed someone, they thought they had the right person, I happened to know the person, and um, he decided I don't want the job. So uh, you know, I was second choice, that's okay. You can't always finish first, as long as you get over the finish line. And, um, but my point here is I remember, uh, now again, I talked to my wife before, before I said, uh, this one I said, you know, we're looking to go to New England, you know, we've been here, but we're gonna move. But at the same time, I remember my father saying to me, do you think you can do this? Have you, no, he said, have you done this before? And I said, well, no. Um, I said, but I think I can do it. And I think I know how to do it because of the foundational knowledge that I got along the way in the various positions I had. But what I, what I really knew is the different functions within international that had to be set up. And I knew the type of person I had to get, for example, to run the operations area. And I got somebody who was really skilled in that area. And then someone to, to do foreign exchange trading. I didn't know how to do it, I knew about it, but got really good people, and when I reflect on my career, and at some point you're all gonna be, you know, one way or another, managing someone, having broader responsibilities. Make sure you get really good people, because you're only gonna be as good as they are, and you wanna make sure that they're, they know their business, you know, that, that whatever their narrow sliver is, a lot better than you do. You have to know about it, but you're never gonna know as much, and if you know as much as the person who's reporting to you, you might not have the right person because they're not gonna push you. So that was a very good experience for me. The, um, but the interesting thing at Baybanks, because it was growing so fast, and this gets back to looking for opportunities, and I didn't know it at the time, um, but now with the benefit of hindsight, I think uh, I might have thought more about how to plan. My career sort of happened to me in many respects, but I might have, in hindsight, planned it better. Because Bay Banks was growing so fast that each of us had opportunities to take on, I was managing the international, they said, well, do you want to start private banking? And do you want to get into the small business? And my wife used to say to me, well, I tell people you're doing, because you're doing a bit of this, a bit of that. So we just tell them I'm doing international. But the benefit to me at the time, hopefully the company benefited a bit, but the benefit to me was to get more experience in different areas. Now, uh, so we fast forward again. Anyone who knows anything about banking, and uh, it's been consolidated. Banks have been, you know, when I started banking, I think there were 15, or 20, 15 to 20,000 banks. There are now about 7,000 banks, give or take. And they'll continue to consolidate. My bank was bought uh, by uh, Bank of Boston. 
And what happened at the time, it wasn't all bad, but it could have been a lot worse. And there's a message here too, is there were organizational changes that were taking place. And at, at one point, I might have been managing four or five different areas under, you know, that reported to me. But all of a sudden, right before the acquisition was announced, there were organizational changes. I was literally not managing anything. I was, as they say, without portfolio. I didn't get fired, but I, you know, the chairman of the company said, well, we'll find something else for you to do. <coughs> but anyone who's ever been involved with an acquisition, buying or selling, you're feeling pretty insecure if you're the one, you know, when they're, and, and Bay Bank was being bought, so I wasn't in charge, but the other bank was in charge, and they're gonna go over and say, what's this person, this person, this person do, and then they get to me and they say, what's he doing, and they do nothing. So that's the kind of person that can lose a job very quickly. Fortunately, at the time, I was involved in managing a couple of areas that came together, and then I left, um, with a, a number of members of, of management, had a good uh, uh, opportunity to, to you know, severance packages. They were fair at the time, and I thought, okay, so I'm gonna take this wealth of experience <laughs> that I've had, and um, I'm gonna go out, and I'm gonna find a job, and I'm gonna run my own bank. Who wouldn't wanna hire me? The answer was nobody. And um, it was a long process. Now, I don't know how many people have either lost a job or have just been trying to change careers and get into different areas. And some of what I'm going to say now is you probably know backwards and forwards, but I didn't at the time because most of my jobs, I went from being more outside with sales to inside quotes management. And it didn't mean what I'm gonna say had to happen, but it did happen. A lot of my network was sort of gone. I mean, just, you know, I knew people, but it wasn't an active network. And the other thing that happened, I hadn't even done a resume in 15 plus years. So I had to go back, and I had help doing this. You know, there was an outplacement firm, so I had help doing this. But I, I, I've learned a lot from having to do that and one of the things I learned about resumes is that I mean, it does tell a story, and it tells your story. But you, it's really important if you're looking for an opportunity to engage the reader. What's gonna capture the reader's attention? And I can tell you one thing. Um, action verbs and words about accomplishment, what you've done, you know, you've got a position, but what have you done in that? grew this business, expanded that, did whatever it is. People want to know about your accomplishments, what you can do. And that was important. And don't make it more than a page either, because uh, don't tell them about all the books you've read and are written and, and this and that. If you've ever read, with due respect to academia, if you've ever gotten a CV from academia, it's like a phone book. And um, you know, don't do that. Make it one page, make it compelling, because that's your marketing piece. That's now, you know, you're your own company and you're marketing yourself. So you want, you know, just as if you were doing a TV ad or a print ad or something on social media, do you want it, how do you want to be reflected? Is it going to sell? Is it going to differentiate? The other thing that I learned in terms of how important it was, and you all are decades younger than I am, but the importance of your network, networking and your specific network. You all have an advantage now because you're on social. And so you connect in a lot of different ways. You know, I was sending smoke signals. You're all sending, you're using your devices and, and, and that's important. But when I thought about my remarks today, I thought your networking is your market research. And you should be networking all the time. You don't, you, you maybe are not networking as much as you might if you were looking for a job, like I was. But uh, your networking is your market research because you're always learning something. 
So your networking is your market research that you're going to apply to your own self-contained business, you. But your network, I assume this is, this is you know, business people, you're in business classes, you know what a balance sheet is. Your network is an asset on your balance sheet. And that's going to grow in value over time. But it takes nurturing. And it's really important to do that. And from the perspective, so once you're, as you're building this, those people who are most important in your network, keep them advised and updated as to what's going on with you. Taking this course, just graduating, looking for an opportunity here or there. That's very important, but you're all so young that you can build this, even if you haven't started this, start it and, and, and keep it, maintain it, keep it fresh, as they say. One thing I've learned, too, is that, uh, and I needed the help, because I was probably out of work for definitely over a year. And I'm going to tell you how I got to where it wasn't the president of the bank. But um, it was through networking. And also, when you're networking, um, a couple of things. Uh, particularly if you're out of work and looking for work. Start with your friends because you can blow it with your friends. You can ask dumb questions, you can ask for advice, and your friends will cut you slack. But you, any network contact, what you're, you need goals and objectives when you go into meeting with someone, you, well, including your friends, but when you're given a network contact, that's probably, you gotta be under 18. That <coughs> might be the one shot. And I've met with lots of people at Cambridge Trust who are just networking. I hear from somebody, you know, it might be my son or daughter, it might be who's out of work, or so and so's looking for an opportunity. And I meet with a lot of people because a lot of people met with me. But I remember meeting with a young person once and you know, talking and having a great time, and I finally said, Stop. And he said, Here's here's something I want you to think about. I'm meeting with you, it's not that I'm that important but whether I meet with you or somebody else meets with you, immediately that sends a message. They want to help. I said, you're making me work too hard. I'm having to ask too many questions. You have to tell me how I can help you. you know, you're interested in accounting. Okay, what do you, you want to know some, somebody in that accounting firm? You want advice on something. So the only message here, this is not earth shattering, but when you're networking, particularly with someone you haven't met, but even if you know the person, tell them how they can help you. If you have an objective, you know, at the end of this meeting, I'd like to know two people who are, who are architects. And if you ask me that question, I'd say, well, they're right in your own building. They, uh, but that's, that's really important. One of the most valuable experiences I had, however, when I was networking, because when I was out of work for quite a while, well over a year, and finally, one of the activities in this firm that, that we did, uh, I call it, uh, it's not the right use of the word, but it was, I call it intervention. So you gather people, some of whom are new friends, some of whom know you, but you, you all gather you think It's a focus group. And they, they say, okay, Joe, what have you been doing? Why, why don't you have a job yet? Let's figure out what's working. And one of my friends said, you, where you're headed, you want to be, you want to run a bank and that's not happening. There weren't a lot of opportunities. My resume apparently wasn't attracting a lot of attention. I wasn't getting on any short lists, so I had to move to plan B. And plan B actually took me back to international banking at a bank called U.S. Trust. And um, my message here is this. Um, it was, at best, a sideways move for me. So all that stuff about careers linear going up into the right, if that happens for you, good for you. Didn't happen for me. There were a couple of these, a couple of that. So I took a position with U.S. Trust that not only was probably sideways or down, I can tell you it was down financially, and I was trying to recall, but it was at least a 25% more cut in pay. It was probably <coughs> more at the time. But I could see where this opportunity if it worked out, and there was a risk, so you just you weigh these things, they're not easy decisions, but you weigh it, and in the end it happened to work out, because at this bank, and when I took the job, I told my wife, I said, look, 
this bank's going to get sold in three to five years. And they got sold in three years. Um, but I, I learned enough along the way that I was willing to take that step sideways to down and see if it worked out. So fast forwarding then today, when I was looking for the Cambridge Trust Company opportunity, and this goes back to the year 2000, and it took me a long time to find that, and you have to be willing to either take that risk, figure out what you're going to live off of, um, cut the budget, and all that kind of stuff. But um, the experience I had through my career, but also the most recent opportunity with U.S. Trust, where I took the risk to take a job that wasn't as good as what I had, but opened up some new opportunities so that when I presented myself to Cambridge Trust Company, there was something that they connected with. Now, before I say a few words uh, about banking, because really that's what you're here to hear, um, I'll tell you a little bit about, not much, but just a little about getting the job. You know, they say networking, if you're looking for a job, it's about getting the interview. You'll want to get the interview. You want to be considered. And then you've got to present yourself. In the area, advice for you in the area of resumes, particularly if your career is going to change at some point. So I said most of my career, or the first half, was international banking. Do I think Cambridge Trust Company cared a lot about international banking? They had to service their corporate customers. But did, but did they really want someone whose first half of their career was in international? Probably not. So if you looked at the resume that I had, I didn't lie, but it, was, it wasn't buried, but it was very much a subordinate issue. So since I was marketing myself, you know, I'm the Joe Roller company, and I'm marketing myself to Cambridge Trust Company, I presented myself as someone who had, did have, you know, there's, everything's real on the resume, a lot of retail experience, a lot of small banking experience, a lot of product and marketing and sales experience. And that's what my resume was when I presented it. Now, if I was looking for a different opportunity, I'd have a different resume. I would just change the emphasis. So you have to think about when you're looking for a different job, think about the messaging in your resume and don't hesitate, hesitate to emphasize one thing versus another. The only last thing I, I would say about uh, that um, interview process was I had thoughts about, I didn't want to be presumptuous, but I thought, this is going to be very competitive. How am I going to differentiate myself from everybody else who's coming in with really powerful credentials? And um, what I did was, I just it wasn't a lot in depth, but I just developed a business plan. And I said, this is how, because I, I had some insights as to what the objective was for the bank going back 15 years ago. And I just talked about that, and I figured if nothing else, um, it, it showed that I cared about this position enough. So I did a business plan. Now in this case, it's different. Um, I also visited all the branches, looked at all the marketing material. And today, you have tools that I didn't have back then. But it's interesting, I was on a search committee for a nonprofit, and one of the candidates who came in knew as much about me as I knew about them because they Googled, the person Googled everybody on the search committee. And so again, advice to you is learn as much as you can about the company you're, you're going to be interviewed with and the people. It might just be some small talk that you're going to do, but when you demonstrate that you've researched the company in depth and you've researched the people you're going to be meeting with and maybe even the board of directors, you're going to di differentiate yourself from somebody else who hasn't done it. It might not make the total difference, but when things are like this, you want to be the one to differentiate yourself. Let me just um, wrap this part up with um, just one other thing which some of you may have or may not have. Um, but if you can identify people along your, during your life, 
who are your mentors or your advisors. It could be in, the, in your workplace, it could be a family member, it could be Uncle Joe, it could be anybody. But look for those people who you can go to for advice who can help you. Uh, I like it. I think companies today are more aware of this. And there's more mentoring going on inside of companies, which is a great tool. It's very, it's, it's very helpful because, you know, we've sort of all been there at, at one level or another. And I think what I found in my experience, uh, most people like to uh, provide some help if they can, as people, particularly where people are expressing interest. So let me stop there for a second. Let me tell you just a bit about banking and I'll take any questions you may have. So when I started in banking, it was retail, um, which was you know, taking accounts, taking applications for credits or home mortgages. It was corporate lending. The bank I worked for had a, then a trust department. They had an HR department. And, you know, sort of that was it. Things were pretty limited compared to today's bank. So I was, as I was putting my notes together, I thought about not only you, in any industry you're going to be in, things are going to change. But today, what's so interesting is that if you you go into a bank, it's it's almost it's a, a microcosm of business. It's one of the reasons I stayed in banking for so many years. I remember when I lost my job with uh, with Bay Bank, somebody said, oh, great, you've got a nice severance package. You can figure out what you want to do and you can get out of banking. I said, I like banking. Because to me, banking was involved in so many different areas of the economy and with, with individuals, with businesses. And it was sort of the, it wasn't the center of the commercial world, but it had a lot to do with it. Some people like that, some people don't. But when I think about the opportunities today, in retail banking, it used to just be branches. But now if you think about all the distribution channels there are, so somebody might say, you know what, I like people, people still go into branches, I want to interact with people, I want to see them face to face, and so I'm going to pursue careers you know, in retail banking. And I can tell you the career path is pretty good because I know what the salaries were for people when they started and then they move up the chain and change if they're running. And we were a small bank, we were only 12 branches. But when you look at larger banks, you go from branch manager, you can manage groups of branches, et cetera, et cetera. But now, of course, there's so many different ways to deliver banking services that so people might want to do their banking online. They may, you know, at from home or today the fastest growth area is mobile banking. Individuals and companies do so much with, with mobile banking. It's, uh, we worry that do we need people. We still need people. And uh, the challenge for banks, particularly when you're not facing people, is if, you're, if your reason for competing is customer service, how can you present yourself as an institution, but still is an institution that knows its customers, interacts with its customers, even if it's doing it remotely. Um, the Customer Resource Center, which is called a phone center at Bay Bank, at Bay Bank, the Cambridge Trust, those people are doing more and more. They used to just be, hello, how are you? You want to know your balance? Fine. Now what they're doing is setting people up on your products. They're talking to them about wealth management, referring them to people. So. All the different channels provide opportunities for people. In corporate banking, in fact, as I said, when I started, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a corporate lender. Now, that's still a pretty good career. <clears throat> and, and the area has gotten so much more interesting. I'll tell you one area that I think is particularly interesting and in growing with all banks. But there's commercial real estate lending. There's lending to small businesses. There's lending to larger companies that may, you may do equipment finance. But one of the most interesting areas that when Cambridge Trust is growing this, but other banks are as well, is community development lending. It's much more challenging, and it really plays an important role. And when I say community development lending, let's say a piece of land becomes available and someone wants to build affordable housing. What you'll find is it's not just a bank, it's probably a partnership that may be someone from, it may be federal money from HUD, it may be state money, We've been in, in activities in Cambridge where Harvard have 
loan some of the money for MIT, and they're usually partnerships of four or five different organizations, and they come together and they'll build housing, you know, which is affordable. And this is an area is probably one of the faster growth areas, uh, certainly here, you know, in Massachusetts, but I think elsewhere. Um, our bank, Cambridge Trust, not every bank has this, not every community bank, but most larger banks have wealth management operations. Somebody get a bad grade? Um, somebody was moaning. Um, but in wealth management, as I think about wealth management, if your interest is, I want to pick stocks, good opportunity there. If you're taking, if I want to be a research analyst to work with the portfolio managers that work with the customers. That's a, that's a big part of wealth management. Somebody else might say, no, I don't want to be investing money. I want to be working on the fiduciary side, on the trust side. I'm more interested in working with those types of legal documents and advising families, not just how to invest their money, but how to plan for the future for their families and for passing on estates. There's also an operational component. There's probably, a, for those who are interested in operational activities, there will always be a demand for folks who have that aptitude and that interest. It could be in bank operations and technology. It could be in a department like wealth management operations. And then, of course, in no matter what area of the bank you're talking about, whether it's wealth management or corporate sales, some people like to be selling. And um, you know whether it's selling home mortgages or it's selling wealth management services, there are always opportunities. And some people, you know, just like being in front of the, the and are confident in being in front of the customer or prospective customer. And if you want to be in sales, as they say, you have to be able to deal with rejection because you'll be rejected many times. But you know, you just figure out how do I do it better. The um, I think one of the biggest growth areas in banking, and there'll be a constant and ongoing demand, is what falls under the umbrella of risk management. Now banking, by definition, is risk management. Just taking a deposit, paying a check, <clears throat> it's a risk. You know, if it's a forged check, the bank has the risk. Today, there are a lot of people who want to commit mischief to figure out how they can either steal money steal identities, you know, just I'll put it under the, the rubric of mischief. Um, every bank has increased ex its spending for people, for systems and technology <clears throat> to protect the bank, to protect its customers, but this could happen in any business. I was over at a, at a retail store today and uh, I was ordering something and, a, and I, you know, the fellow said, can I see your credit card? I've known this guy for 20 years. He said, can I see your credit card? And I said, you've got this on your system, don't you? It's funny, I was thinking about it. I was walking over, I said, gee, do I feel comfortable? He said, no, we don't allow that anymore. You know, with all the things that happen, have happened, you know, whether it's Target, whether it's Neiman Marcus, whether it's BJ's Wholesale, all these places, whether it's the own federal government, but a lot of hackers. So, one of the biggest challenges and one of the biggest risks that banks face because they try to protect so much information, personal information, its own information, and money. Um, when people would say, what kept you up at night? Risk management or cyber fraud, that would worry me the most because that's about reputation. And um, we all assume, I heard a person speak at one point, he said there are two kinds of business, people who run businesses. Those who have had a cybersecurity attack and are dealing with it, and those that have had a cybersecurity attack and they don't know about it because they haven't figured it out yet. And how a company responds, I mean, in today's world, you won't be judged because, well, you can still be judged if they steal a lot of data, but it's how you recover from that. So if somebody decides they're gonna penetrate Cambridge Trust Company and shut down the email system or the whole communication system, how fast do you respond? There are so many opportunities within financial institutions of all kinds, banks, investment management firms, who have information to protect, so a growth area. 
Um, if you like marketing, great opportunities in marketing, in banking, in financial services for a couple of reasons. One, and marketing to me is in the broadest you know, it's, it's the product, it's the pricing, it's distribution, it's how you market, it's not just advertising. Although advertising has been, I can remember when I started the bank, we just we did print advertising, that was it. And we dabbled a little bit in radio, WBUR, and we did WBZ, and we did a little bit of sports talk, not sure how good that was. And then we did TV advertising, and of course today we do social. Um, I know the budgets for, you know, Cambridge Stress is still a relatively small bank, but that's where the, the hiring is taking place in marketing, the hiring is taking place in lending, the hiring is taking place in risk management. And they're all good career opportunities. So uh, keep in mind that it's not just for banks, but human resources is a great career, if, and, and that is one that also is growing because it's benefits management, it's training development, it's workforce development, diversity, there's just a lot of opportunities there. And I'll finish up with just saying, um, in corporate, we develop products, and cash management services, so you, you might be lending someone money, but companies need services to buy, to manage their own bank accounts and cash management positions. So there are just so many opportunities in banking. I think they'll continue to be, the industry will continue to consolidate. And the most important thing for anyone who's going into that is just to be aware of what's going on, in, whether it's in banking or architecture or technology. It's good to be aware of what's happening in your business. So that's been the tour de force, probably a little too long, but I like talking. So, um, and not too many people fell asleep. Um, do you have any questions about anything? So, oh, what a sonic group. You're too tired for class. Anybody want to take exception? Oh, sorry. Well, with, the, with the rise of interstate branching and things of that sort, uh, do you think that the small community banks are going to be crowded out? Well, here's what the way, if ever, did ever hear the question, basically, are you too small to compete? Uh, and if you look at the difference between Cambridge Trust Company and Bank of America, you know, there's a David and Goliath story there. But uh, when Mark introduced me, he talked about Cambridge Trust being in the top quartile of, of banks in performance. And that's part of our goals. That's written into our compensation plans. And our goals are set, you know, a lot of, a lot of companies will have goals and they'll say, well, to, to get your bonus, you have to be above median. At Cambridge Trust Company, we say you have to be a top quartile. And so part of the answer to the question is, are you, are you delivering? And we're a public company, so we have shareholders. So are we delivering adequate returns to our shareholders such that we can stay independent? I can tell you, at Cambridge Trust Company, the board, management, Probably even many of the shareholders want the bank. They think there's a place for community banks. They want to see community bank. What keeps banks, though, performing at a level is to make sure you have good strategies, that you execute on your strategies, that you constantly measure how you're doing. And just because you have a strategic plan, you have business plans, they're not cast in concrete. If, if it's not working, Figure out why it's not working. If it's working, can it work better? If you can't fix it, get rid of it. Just assume made a mistake, not the right plan, we're gonna go on to something else. When smaller banks try to be like larger banks, meaning all things to all people, they'll probably end up getting sold in the end. And so, long answer, there are some banks though that are just so small, and with the growing demands that came about after the financial crisis and the dot frank legislation, I can tell you at Cambridge Trust it's tough because the people were added. I mean, they're all expenses. 
they're not bringing in revenue. One can argue they're preventing losses, but that's still not revenue. And I, that it'll just be too hard for many banks, uh, particularly in a low interest rate environment, to, to remain independent. But I think there's still a place for banks like ours and you know, I see Century Bank, I know the Sloan's very well, great bank, community bank. Um, they're gonna be around forever because they know how to run a bank. And, uh, and I see Eastern Bank on here, another great bank. They're not a stock bank though, so they're, they're a mutual bank and they're gonna continue being independent. So I think there's a place for them. Oh, good question. I should ask you guys a question. Sorry. Sudan. Okay. Uh, my question, what's your advice to me to find a job in a bank in the Okay, well, if, so the, que the question was, you've got banking experience, that's a lot of banking experience, and how can you take that to find opportunities here? Now, although banking practices may differ from one country to another, in a lot of respects, banking's banking. And I would start first with looking at what the areas that you work in, where you have that experience, and then try to mirror that. If, if you liked what you were doing, look for opportunities that, where they would want to take advantage of your skills. Because you know any organization you go to, people are going to hire you because they think you have the aptitude and they'll fill in the training that you may need. So um, now, because I haven't been looking for work for a long time, I know there are lots of different ways, you know, the job postings are all on social today. I know our own company. You can write directly to companies, but I think every company probably has a website with job opportunities. And I would go to the banks because there are so many. So if, there if there's a particular area you're interested in, I would look at those opportunities on their websites, apply to them directly, think about people you may know who could help you network in to that particular company. But I think you'll find a lot of banks with, uh, that, have, that have job openings. And it's a, they're good places to work. All the community banks that I mentioned are, are solid community banks. Cambridge Trust happens to be the best, but they're all good. <laughs> I'm kidding, they're all good. So, but, but very good question. Yes?
said, my gosh, get your head out of the sand and start looking like this. So I think uh, the expression I would use, I would say, I'd, I'd be mapping. I'd say, what am I, learn what, what am I doing here and map it against you know, what this guy's been talking about up here on the stage for the last half hour, see if there's any mapping, or talk to people individually and see if there are uh, crossover areas. But, uh, but I'd still, if you're doing well in healthcare, I'd hang in there. And it just happens to be a big growth, I mean, and particularly in this market. It's a good career to be in, yes? Mm. How little banks are dealing with that, and do you know, are you seeing any improvement in that? Yeah, it's, the question is, with all the damage that was done to banks um, in uh, the, the financial crisis, um, how are banks adjusting, adapting to that? And um, as some people would say, including my close friends, oh, banker, because you know, they make jokes about lawyers and whoever, but bankers were right down there at the bottom. And one thing that was troubling in the crisis, and our own senator sometimes doesn't help us, that would be Senator Warren. Um, she will often use statements um, about bankers <coughs> with a broad brush. And I know Delegations from mass bankers have actually, we speak to our own delegates, whether they be congressmen or senators, and we will from time to time <clears throat> caution them rather than to say, you know, fat cat bankers, or what she, there was something written recently where she said, bankers' business models are built on cheating. And here's the problem with that. If I said, Cambridge College students all have a, are all cheaters. Now, a couple of cheaters were here. That's one thing. There's always a risk when you categorize a group. So here's why I say this. Um, there were a lot of people and organizations who, in, in financial institutions, including banks, who did who were deceitful, they broke the law, I think. I'm surprised more people didn't go to jail. And that didn't happen. Apparently it's very hard to prove. So when you go back and you look at a big part of the financial crisis, it was the mortgage business. And there were big companies, uh, I, you know, countrywide, I mean many of them, countrywide mortgage, WAMU, um, the loans, I, I remember my own nephew, he called me up, he said, Uncle Joe, I'm doing this with a loan, and he explained it to me. I said, Rich, I can't understand this. I know a little bit about banking, but you, can you get out of this mortgage? Oh, yeah, no problem. A year later, he called me, he said, Uncle Joe, you know what? My mortgage rate went way up. And I said, and, and it, I forget the term, it was some kind of floating rate, exotic type product. And I said, okay, we'll get out of it. He said, oh, that's the other thing. I, I didn't read all the, the print. It's going to cost me $5,000 to get out of it. And it's those types of activities where the government should, come, should have come in and said, not only shame on you, but change it. And there were a lot of people who were put into products um, that they shouldn't have been in. Their income wasn't checked. Property values weren't checked. So that was a disaster. I can tell you, um, so a lot of, uh, there were a lot of foreclosures in all of that period from 08 to really 06 to the present. Cambridge Trust may have had one, possibly two. Other community banks, same thing. Because the community banks were underwriting loans the way they should be underwritten. And that is, do people have the ability, it starts with, do they have the ability to repay? And um, so there was a lot of deceit carried out. But what happened, the industry got colored with it. And, um, but I think you'd find today, 
if you you know got your own market research, the regard for if you could say banks in general, it's, it would be higher than it used to be, but it would still be not great. But I think if you differentiated not just small banks like ours, but you know regional banks that are you know multi-state banks, I think they'd have a, a better reputation. Uh, it, I can tell you it hasn't hurt a hiring at all. Um, but it's a really good question, and we're still recovering from that, and that's why I say when our state representatives make broad statements, we have to remind them, you know, we employed 230 people, our, our own little bank here, and you're not helping us if, if you're saying we're cheaters. So just think about what you're saying. And um, so we have time for one last question. I was wondering when you were going to speak up. <laughs> Um, I, I, this is kind of from the consumer side of things. Yeah. Um, uh, would you have any insight to an individual um, that may be more on an entrepreneurial side of things and kind of developing business ideas? Um, do you have any advice in terms of looking into potential small business loans? What do banks look for? Um, what would they be more encouraged by in terms of either business plan, credit scores, this or that? Or would you even advise potentially against going that route more go for independent funding, venture capitalists and whatnot? Mm. It's a broad question. Yeah. So let me, um, if, you're, if you're talking to a bank and it's, it's a new business, what, what, much of small business today, is based small business lending, is based on credit scoring. They're looking at you, you know, what's your track record? And if I look at companies, you know, new businesses, how do they get started? Where do their funds come from? Usually starts with friends and family, uh, their own personal credit. A lot of businesses have been done on the backs of credit cards. Uh, the interesting thing about entrepreneurs is that they have a passion. And, um, and if they have good business plan, I mean, good ideas, good plans, uh, that passion usually gets fulfilled. On the other hand, we all know nine out of 10 new companies probably fail. Um, and that's just the way it happens. Um, when you're going into a bank, uh, the business plan is really important. You know, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? Who's your market? Why do you think you're going to be? Well, how do you differentiate yourself? And you know, and how are you going to measure your results? If you're if you're going there to start a company, if you're going to a bank and asking them to make a loan for you to start the company, that's what we would call equity. So that's going to be unlikely that you're just going to get a loan for that. doesn't mean you couldn't borrow personally, and the bank might say, you're, you're a pretty good creditors, but we'll lend you the money. I think what I'm seeing in today's world is more, there are, we tend to refer to them as um, the alphabet soup, but there are a lot of state organizations with different letters. You know, I'll just say Mass, mass Development is probably the biggest umbrella organization, but there are a lot of little subsets and they'll often make matching loans or new loans or maybe even put equity in. The SBA also has its own, I'm not well, well versed enough to tell you about that, but the SBA also has programs uh, for that. And I'm all in, I mean, small business is the lifeblood of this country. I mean, it's, that's where the jobs are being created. And um, I mean, you just don't have to go too far down the street here to, to Kendall Square, they're just, if I, spent some time at the Cambridge Innovation Center, and I know there are companies that have come out of that, those are going to be companies coming out of that, but there are also little pockets. Somebody over in Somerville has got something going. So uh, if, you, if you've got an, and here again, I would use your network, call them your advisors. If you've got an idea, you, you want people who are going to be candid with you. You'll find, you'll find the resources, I mean, things are changing so fa fast now, but, you know, you got, crowdfunding going on. There are lots of different ways to raise money that weren't even I'm, I'm reading about but haven't done. But I think it's a wonderful opportunity to do it. And anybody who, you know, take a risk. You know, risk to me, it, it's just a matter of measuring. You know, you want to manage your risk that you're taking. And uh, your friends, your advisors, they'll tell you whether you're, uh, you're heading in, in the right direction. That doesn't mean you have to listen to them if they disagree with you. But I think there's sources of money. When the venture capital side is when you're pretty far along. Angel financing is um, 
you know, here again, if I were looking, if I were serious, and I, I would try to find somebody who does annual financing in their organizations, they're actually umbrella organizations that have different members. And, um, and if you know someone in one of those, they can tell you specifically because they're getting business presentations, multiple business presentations every week. And they can tell you how to put it together and what they're looking for. But um, it's a good area to go. They're a good group. I've uh, enjoyed this. And I'll, if anybody's that classic person who's ready to hold their hand up and just wants to ask a question, I'll take the mic off and answer the question. So uh, feel free to ask me after we, everybody breaks. But I know you also have some classes to go to or, or dinner to get or whatever it might be. I'm going to ask, and I'll give her a round of applause.